Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 765. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 11th, 2022. Welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of their webcams and talk about Anglican news, Christian news, politics, whatever we we talk about in the pre-show and more. We don't always just stick to the pre-show for some reason. We should because we start to get off topic. Well, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, 764. <laughs> no, 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 no rabbit trails here. 764 was uploaded and corrupted by YouTube. Some of you said, where's the audio? Mrs. Coulson thought that was our best episode ever. She's like, this is great. I don't have to hear you in the background. You know? and so that was fixed. I re-uploaded 764. If you didn't get a chance to watch it, you need to go back and watch 764. It has lots of great information about what's happening around the world in Anglicanism. George, how are you doing this week? Wonderful time, Kevin. The weather has changed. It's cool. Uh, for me, it's freezing. It's in the 60s in the mornings. Uh, but church life is really taking off again. We're seeing people I haven't seen in two years back in church. Uh, classes have resumed, activities have resumed, and in fact, this weekend, I am participating in a walkathon. Yes, uh, we are got a team together for the church, and we're raising money for the Pregnancy and Family Life Center of Citrus County. That's one of the places our people, our congregation volunteers, and Last year, we were able to help 135, I think 135 girls who were going to have, otherwise have abortions, uh, deliver their babies, help them with food and clothing and classes, and it's a wonderful work. And, shameless commercial plug, you can contact us, <laughs> me, on, this, on the comments section if you want to pledge five bucks, ten bucks. We're not asking for a lot of money. Uh, because my wife is the head of the team, and if she raises a certain amount of money, she gets a free T-shirt, and she wants a T-shirt. So, folks, instead of getting that uh, Frappo, Mappo, Rappuccino, whatever it is, at Starbucks, send me five bucks to help uh, pregnant uh, teenage girls know that there's a better way. There, yeah, shameless yeah. plug over. And now no, back no. to the Lucky Strikes Hour with Kevin and George. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, pregnancy centers are an amazing uh uh, function that we we can serve here uh, in the United States. Now, the Episcopal Church head office thinks that they're evil, but that's oh, yeah. a lie. Yeah, they're, they're not evil. Uh, they make unwanted children wanted children, and it's it's a wonderful thing to see and to participate in. Jill and I uh, love to give generously to uh, pregnancy centers around Florida and around the world um, because that is what we've been preaching since the first Roe v. Wade. Of course they're wanted children. If they're not, uh, we'll Kevin, show you how to want them. Yep. Kevin has suggested, I have two pairs of shoes, one that it. is brown <laughs> and one that is black that has little uh, wingtips on the top. And Kevin has suggested that I get a pair of sneakers for this walk. Uh, I was going to wear the brown ones because I have a brown belt and you know tan pants so it all matches. But uh, Kevin suggests sneakers, but I think I need to maintain my professional dignity and walk in uh, wingtip shoes in a, in a walkathon. <sighs> that's that's a lot of dignity there, George. All right, let's move on to the news. Uh, did I tell you where I was? I, I'm in Charleston, yeah. South Carolina uh, for uh, next week. Jill and I are here visiting some of the plantations and sites to see and churches. I went to Holy Trinity on Sunday, uh, one of the churches that lost its property and uh just a, a lot of stuff happening in charleston then we're heading back to home base in, in webster florida where this whole summer of travel uh is finally over so i just heard something out of charleston which we didn't talk about in the pre-show isn't mere anglicanism going to restart uh, yes in fact if they want to advertise in the program or anglican.inc they can do so yes mere anglicanism something that was a wonderful conference offered for many years uh here in charleston area has restarted i don't know why they stopped they got plenty of money uh covid but, uh, covid covid no it stopped before covid it stopped uh uh three or four years before covid so now it started up again yay so 
And if they advertise, we will say it's in Charleston. If they don't advertise, you know, it's in Savannah this year. Yeah. You can, whoop, whoop, whoops, whoops. So, well, I'm, whoops. It's not that we ever make mistakes like that, Kevin, is it? No. It's called mayonnaise. That, that's oh, the man. new word for senior moments in the Coulson camper. And here's how that happened. Uh, three or four weeks ago, Jill said, Kevin, let's get Chick-fil-A for dinner. Go. Go. Go get Chick-fil-A. Be useful. So I hop in the car. And I drive to the local Chick-fil-A, 20 miles away. A lot of traffic. It was raining. I, I had lost full concentration. I pull up, and Betty Sue's there from Asheville to take my order. And she goes, name for the order. Simple answer there. Kevin. K Got that one? Yeah. Yeah. What would you like? I'll take two number ones <laughs> in a Diet Coke. That's not hard. Boom. Question that, that, that caught me up. Would you like sauce with that? Uh, uh, yeah, regular. Oh, Jill always wants the sauce. I'll take the regular sauce. Betty Lou didn't recognize the regular. She goes, mayonnaise? Yeah, mayonnaise. That's what I always get here. Sure, I'll take mayonnaise. So I show up back home without the Chick-fil-A sauce. I had to explain to Jill why there's a bag full of mayonnaise. And I said, Well, mayonnaise uh, and french fries, isn't yeah, that a, a Texas thing or something? It's a senior moment. So now our joke is mayonnaise. That's a mayonnaise moment. And uh, we, we, now we really can identify when this happening because I'm of the age where there's a lot of mayonnaise from eating too much mayonnaise. So, George, let's move on to, yeah? I had a, I, in college, I had some friends from Texas that said uh, when you put mayonnaise on a hamburger, it's called a sissy burger in Dallas. Sissy but, burger. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, these guys are tough out in Texas. I don't they know. They are tough. Um, as reported last week, Church of England is just, uh, uh, it released a report on its sex offenders, th some 300 cases. You know, it goes way beyond that. Um, it, it's in free fall. It, the, the Church of England since Lambeth has had bad news week after week after week here on Anglican Unscripted. It's not that we're, we're looking for it, it's just it's so predominant we have to report on it. And we're going to report on it again here after our first news story. But our first news story is the ANIE out of England is having two bishops consecrated by Archbishop Foley Beach and a secret uh, unannounced a uh, high-level person from another province we can't talk about yet, uh, as well. And this is big news because it shows uh, a rather docile ANIE for the last uh, four years is starting to get the move on, starting to get their game together, because they're now the only game in town. The Church of England has lost the benefit of the doubt. People who thought Justin Welby could pull this out, he's, he's now a duelist. He thinks there's two teachings that are perfectly normal on human sexuality within the Anglican Communion. Nope, that's not going to fly. And we have another report of a, a new dean for the Canterbury Cathedral we'll talk about later. So there's a lot going on, but do we have the names yet, George, of these two bishops, Lex? Yes, we do. Um, on the 21st of October, two men will be consecrated by Foley Beach and an unnamed foreign dignitary. And he can he cannot be named he who cannot be named <laughs> because if it becomes if the if the gnomes at church house or at lambeth palace find out they'll do their best to stick a spoke in those wheels mm -hmm. well foley beach will be consecrating ian ferguson and stuart bell now i think we've met ian ferguson here's a balding guy in his late 50s early 60s with glasses don't know if I've met that, many people. That like was me. That. Well, that was me. <laughs> I think we met at Gafcon in Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I think we did. Um, he was formerly the rector of Saint Silas Episcopal Church in Scotland. I think it's in Glasgow, which is one of the major powerhouse uh, evangelical churches. And Stuart Bell was the former rector or vicar or incumbent of Saint Michael's in Aberystwyth in the church in Wales. These are two. Uh, powerful evangelical pastors preachers and of course andy Lyons is the original anie bishop so now we have a bishop in england we have a scots bishop and we have a welsh bishop and it makes perfect sense because some were saying well why do they need more bishops when they have few congregations well if you're planning to establish and grow 
you cannot assume everybody's going to be English because, you know, the Scots don't get on with the English and the English don't get on with the Welsh. There's a lot of... And nobody gets on with the Irish, of course. (laughs) No. (laughs) So this is a perfectly logical and, and I would think very intelligent step forward to basically create more than one center of not so much power, but center of growth, one that can speak to the Welsh experience, one that can speak to the Scots experience, one to the English experience. Uh, because even though in America we just all call them English, they're not all English. They're, they're British, which uh, constitutes many things these days. Yeah. So, uh, well, keep in the news. I hear that they're going to be live streaming it. I'll try to provide a link on Facebook uh, when that happens. And this is neat because, you know, since Peter Jensen and GAFCON 2 said we want to establish a foothold for GAFCON in the Church of England, and even back then we rolled our eyes, that'll never happen, um, it's now slowly happening. And it's not so much that, uh, you know, the ANE, i.e. has a lot of money and everything's are going their way it's going their way because the church of england is an absolute collapse and i want to highlight a story uh that i just got this morning about the new dean of the canterbury cathedral and i want to highlight that by going back to a person called jeffrey john i think his name was he was the uh uh to be a bishop elect and i forget the diocese um but he was reading uh, reading assistant bishop for reading in the diocese of oxford He was a gay man who was going to be bishop, and Rowan Williams was going to appoint him to be bishop, or however that worked back then. But Rowan Williams, and this is rumor or not rumor, nobody will confirm or deny it, met with the queen, and after meeting with the queen, he no longer supported the election or uh, uh, consecration of Jeffrey John. Years later, 2022, we now have the new dean of Canterbury Cathedral is a partnered gay man. David is living with David. And I thought, well, we could talk about this because a lot has changed since the days of Rowan Williams, George. Yes, David Monteith who was announced this morning to be the next dean of Canterbury Cathedral. He has a civil partner also named David who is a therapist. He's the currently the dean of Leicester. This is problematic on many levels. First, uh, Justin Welby, you you hear his words, but then you look at his actions. Mm -hmm. Senior appointment after senior appointment, either on his personal staff or within the hierarchy of the Church of England, is they're being filled by one sort of person. Uh, How many more conservative evangelicals or Anglo-Catholics are being appointed to these things? None. So... Justin Welby is talking the talk of all are welcome, there's no blocking you if you don't hold to my positions, when what we're seeing is certain people are favored. Now, a few years ago, we reported how the uh, local, the Freemasons in England helped pay for the renovation of Canterbury Cathedral. In return, the all-seeing eye and some other Masonic symbolism was installed on a stone in the cathedral. Gavin was very, Gavin Ashenton was very exercised about this. And we uh, basically told some of the Africans about this, and they were like horrified because Freemasonry for them is satanic. But, you know, they sort of, okay, well, you know, let's they learned just to keep live with on. it. Yeah. They learned to live with it. Now, if there's going to be another Lambeth conference, are they going to be able to live with a gay dean being their host in the cathedral? Yeah. Well, hold on. Um, the Global South is waking up this morning to this type of news, where after all the promises of Justin Welby that we will, you know, obviously never go that far, he's gone that far. And he, mm-hmm. he, he crossed his T's and dotted his I's. And the Church of England, where on paper and doctrine does not endorse, support, or bless, or uh, conduct uh, same-sex marriages, it's certainly a uh, a practice they don't condone by their workforce, George. It's it is discouraging if you're an institutionalist to see this, and if you're a supporter of the Church of England, it's been a miserable two weeks in the press. 
Last week, we had the announcement of 380 further cases of abuse. And these are only cases where the victims went through the rigor of making a formal complaint and filling out the paperwork against the blocking tactics of the of the blob, the Church of England staff. Well, this week, all the local newspapers are running 20 children, uh, 20 adults victimized in Durham, how many in Chester, how many in Truro. So the local pa pa papers are picking it up and looking at what's happening in their neighborhoods. And you're having local radio, uh, Andrew Greystone, who's a victim's advocate, was on, I think, BBC North or BBC York, talking about how Stephen Cottrell, uh, he's Greystone is happy that Cottrell is taking responsibility, but what does that actually mean? He's saying, I'm sorry, but nothing changes. No, nobody, you know, no, the victims of John Smythe, whom Welby has promised to meet with for several years now. Never happened yet. Not, never happens. Yeah. So the, the image of the Church of England, it's going through in America 10, 15 years ago, we had the Catholic abuse scandal. And that was, a, yeah. well, it was a major, major scandal that really hurt the reputation of the Catholic Church in the eyes of the average man and woman. And the Church of England, is, I think, is going through that right now, where you have, and then you have former insiders who are basically taking a hatchet to it. And I'm not just talking about Stuart Bell and uh, Ian Ferguson. Martin Percy, the former dean of Christchurch Cathedral, who quit the Church of England, uh, has been penning articles. This last one said the bishop should get out of the House of Lords, because mm -hmm. if they've only represent one or two percent of the population, they have no claim to speak for the people. Um, disestablishment may come not by some political plan and settlement and way forward, but by just the sheer weight of incompetence exercised by the leaders of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby's promise not to exercise leadership, that's the one promise he's been keeping, the promise he made at the Lambeth Conference. Mm -hmm. And so we've got an anarchy, and we've got, you know, we're supposed to have a replacement for Rod Thomas, Bishop of Ed's fleet. Now, they're going to make Ed's fleet uh, a suffragan bishop uh, for Canterbury because Rose Hudson Wilkes, the Bishop of Dover, is so incompetent, they need another bishop to actually do the job So because she's a token. But one of the flying bishops is going to be an evang conservative evangelical. Who's it going to be? When are they going to do this? Will there be any conservative evangelicals left for this fellow to have oversight for? Bad time in the Church of England. Really bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mess, and uh, uh, it, the cool thing about this is the mess is being carried by the the BBC and uh, the local press in, in uh, England and Europe. That's that's the I, awesome I, thing. Go I ahead. would liken it because, like yesterday, uh, this morning in the New York Times, on one of the inside pages, they have an article: uh, uh, Joe Biden, teller of tall tales that don't always turn out to be true. We've seen a change in the U.S. mainstream media of absolutely Biden problem, you know, pump, you know, pump him up, pump him up, pump him up, don't challenge him, don't question him, to now they're really tearing him down. And in some aspects, we're seeing that same trans transformation in the BBC concerning the Church of England. It's always been critical of it, but now it's, they can't do anything right, the Church well, of England and the BBC's eyes. It, it's not just that they can't do anything right. There's just so much dirty laundry it can't be ignored. You know, mm -hmm. going after old dead bishops. You know, the press is like, really? Okay, we'll, we'll try and send out a reporter. Going after, mm -hmm. you know, former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Really? He wasn't that bad? All right, we'll send out a reporter. The dirty laundry of last week's report is so filthy and disgusting. They have no choice to, but to report on it. Oh my lord, what is this? You know, what town has not been affected by bad clergy persons or laity within the Church of England? Why are there so many victims in all these churches? Disgusting. Of course, you're going to uh, hit the press for the, and this is the right reason to be hit in the press for some transformation within your church. 
It's England has a more institutionalist mindset than we do in the United States. Um, and this Church of England abuse scandal is unfolding just as some press outlets are really pressing home the grooming, uh, basically Muslim men from Pakistan and Bangladesh grooming underage British girls for you know for sex for sex. Right. Um, yeah. You know, there's one story that came across the screen to say 27 men uh, charged with raping a girl from the age of like 11 to 15, and the police have been covering this up. They've not been acting on it because they don't want to be accused of being racist. They've not reported that some of the motivations for these rapes and sexual attacks are not just sexual urges, but to destroy and to victimize young white British girls. This is a this is on the pages the same time the Church of England abuse things are on the pages, and it's all getting wrapped together in the common mind. Mm -hmm. And if you had a good leader like Justin Welby, who does more than just say, I'm sorry, it's all my fault and does nothing, uh, he could do something about this and change yeah. the perception. But he is the man who's making it worse. And well, I mean, uh, he, he is responded to, to the fool. he's responded to the word phobic the wrong way. It's not phobic when it's destroying your society and your church. Okay, Islamophobia, uh, yeah, 20 years ago it was pretty bad after some of the terrorist attacks, but what is happening right now in some of the cultural places where there's militant uh, Islamists uh, conducting uh, gang raping and grooming, y you need to, as a church, be able to stand up and not be afraid to be called phobic because it's not phobia. It's a real fear based on real evidence, and these reports show it. Uh, Kevin, I, I should say, I shouldn't call Justin uh, Welby a fool, because Raka, don't call somebody a fool. So I'll say, just say, he is foolish. Yes. We'll make it an adjective, not a noun. His Please. actions are foolish. Yeah, yeah covered myself. Okay, How's that? Covered yourself, you know. It, 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 this is the hard part of Anglican Scripted, when you, you sit down and you have to talk about the leaders in the church and do it under the, uh, the perfect guise of the kingdom. You know, we're here to talk about accountability with the church, to talk about what's not working and what is working. And here's another part that's not working. It's an organization called Mermaids, uh, which is supported by the Church of England as well, sadly. Mermaids is what type of organization, George? It's a transgender activist charity. Mm -hmm. They have been informing public debate in schools, in Christian education, in the churches, about transgenderism. Recently, Mermaids was revealed to have an online web presence, a chat room where 12 to 19 year olds could chat if they have questions about their gender identity. And Kevin, you are an IT guy. Who are the sorts of people who chat on websites for 12 to 19 year olds? No, 35 to 65 year old perverts who uh, did not get their sexual gratifications when they were young adolescents and uh, are living out their fantasies by uh, pretending to be uh, children on island forums. This has been thoroughly investigated by the FBI. CIA had a couple programs in it. Uh, it happens all the time here in America where the evil behind the internet is you don't really know who you're talking to on the other side. And these uh, people with sexual dysfunction show up on these forums and they're 55, they say they're 16 or 14, and they get into conversations with adolescents of, of that age and try to convince them that, you know, you don't really have a dysphoria, really, it's not gender dysphoria. You were actually born a, a woman in a male body. And there's one solution. Don't let people counsel you on this. The only solution is to find a scalpel, not a psychologist. And Kevin, we for years have been talking about female genital mutilation in Africa, where in some cultures it's uh, they uh, circumcise women. I'm not going to get into the details. No. Now we're doing that in the U.S. and the U.K. and in Europe with this transgender stuff. We're mutilating young boys and girls. We're castrating them. We're performing mastectomies on children who are confused 
And in California, it's being done without the knowledge or permission of parents. It's just satanic times. It's really satanic. Um, the Times of London had an article about the mermaids, and I believe it was the Times who said, you know, one mother of a 13-year-old autistic boy who found this website, she found on his phone all these sexual images, all these, it, it was exactly as you said, he was being groomed. He was a confused boy who found this probably from a school reference. If you have questions, check yeah. with the mermaids. And it was a trap to entrap this boy into sexual encounters with perverts. Uh, the uh, One of the trustees of Mermaids, his name is what, Jacob Breslow, had to resign because it was revealed that he was a member of the British equivalent. In America, we have something called NAMBLA, North American Man-Boy Love Association. You know what that means. Mm -hmm. He was found to be a member of the British pedophile group that promotes sexual relations between adults men and and minors these are the people running met mermaids and nigel and sally rowe two british parents uh, who live on the isle of Wight, they were interviewed recently with, by the times sunday times have written to the archbishop of canterbury saying the church of england school they have a child that they took out of a church of england school on the isle of Wight because their child i forget how it was five six was lender transphobic for not uh, going along with calling a confused child by the child's proper pronouns. I have kids in my Sunday school. I have a nine-year-old girl who thinks she's a mermaid. Uh, you know, does that mean that her she's going to be taken away by the state of California, her legs cut off and a, 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 a fins put off? You know, we, I know there's one five-year-old girl. She thinks she's a bunny rabbit this week. And children that age in church of england schools are allowed to determine their identity i'm a bunny rabbit i'm a boy i'm a girl i'm an elf i'm a pixie i'm a fairy and nigel and sally rose said this advice from the church of england's education department is illegal it's immoral it violates safeguarding practices whoa and they they got, wrote, oh, hold on hold they, they use safeguarding Yes, they used the one thing that would catch Justin <laughs> Welby's attention when they wrote a letter to him All right. that the Times published. it. It's a bad situation, Kevin. But the good thing that the people like Nigel and Sally Rowe, parents, ordinary parents, no, not activists, not professional complainers, who are taking a stand for their children and who are godly people. And I want to give a plug to people like Andrea Minichilla Williams, and her Christian Legal Society, um, and the Alliance to, uh, ADF International groups that are fighting the good fight in England and their counterparts, the United States, to stop this destruction of the next generation. But here is where the press has been bad in all this. Yeah, they, they cover a couple controversial letters and uh, published to uh, Justin Welby and others, but uh, when a person uh, wakes up one morning and discovers that their body's been mutilated and they were uh, basically attacked by a groomer, uh, they want to detransition. Right now there's a Reddit group with 34,000 uh, uh, kids, people from 13 to 25 years of age, who are trying to detransition and get advice. Mm -hmm. Hey, I woke up one day a girl and <laughs> all I did was, you know, in third grade question something, something, something. And what do I do now? Uh, I've been taking hormones for uh, six months. I want to detransition. When will my breasts grow back? Um, you know, all these, these questions. And I'm going to provide a link to this Reddit group so that you guys can go there and be informed because the press isn't telling you anything about those who want to detransition. And there's a mess of them, and it, it's well into the, the 55, 60 percent rate, and this has only been going on for 15 years. Uh, you have, you wake up one day and you realize I've been groomed, because I'm really not uh, gender dysphoric anymore. That was a period of my life. I'm beyond it. Uh, I am truly a man, or I am truly a woman. How do I live into it now when I'm missing the parts? And as a yeah, church. Remember no, but hold on one second. As a church, we need to be able to minister to these people who are missing parts. 
You know, they, 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 they come to their senses and they realize they've been groomed. They, they met with a surgeon, not a psychologist, and boom, it's gone. And I've been taking hormones and my voice isn't uh, the, the right tone for my sex. What do I do? And you as a church need to be there to help. And my church, not my parish, my denomination, I am ashamed to say at their last general convention in Baltimore said, children have the right to determine their own sexual identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've known for a long time that they're nuts and kooks at the leadership of the Episcopal Church, but some of the things they're doing are just satanic. Just satanic. Um, we, uh, Kevin, you mentioned earlier uh, when I mentioned the Pregnancy Life Center, the Walkathon. Uh, you mentioned uh, about General Convention. Well, for those who don't remember, there was a move by General Convention. A deputy from Ohio wrote a paper saying that pregnancy and family life centers are scams. They're oppressive. They're evil. Basically, he took Elizabeth Warren's talking points, the senator from Massachusetts, wrote it up in a paper, brought it to the General Convention, and the House of Deputies passed it without debate because of the shortened time. And fortunately, some of the bishops in the House of Bishops said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a step too far even for the Episcopal Church to denounce pregnancy and family life centers. So the, the rot is not just in the Church of England, it's in the Episcopal Church, it's in the school systems in the United States, it's in the government in the United States and in Britain, yeah. in the NHS. It's just, oh, it's a difficult time. It is. We have demons running the church. And, you know, we need to wake up to that and say, you know, if you're grooming somebody for anything other than a walk with Christ, that's a, you're not even grooming them for that. If you're grooming somebody uh, and you're you're demonic, you know, because you, Kevin, you're taking just groom dogs. Just let's just take, groom, take, dogs. Take groom dogs. Cats, okay, yes. let's let's leave it there. Don't groom people. Groom yeah. dogs and cats and yeah. horses uh, and things. Yeah, yeah, Kevin. What really exercises you? Just really just. A you know, few things get me as angry and, uh, you know, just to speak to my soul as transgenderism, uh, LGBTQ, uh, things that are really destroying uh, individuals, not just societies. And, and it, it's so very hard for families and parents and friends of people going through this. What do they respond to? The, you love them. You love those who are going through these emotional, moral oh, times. Yes. Yeah. Loving them, though, does not mean going along to get along, to avoid arguments, to avoid fighting. You affirm them, you support them, but you don't affirm what they think is wrong. My yeah, daughter, yeah. as you, many of you know, had suffered from anorexia. Mm -hmm. In her mind, she was obese. Well, she was in, her, in college, so we weren't there with her when she went through this. And she wound up in a hospital for several months with a mental disease akin to gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. Now, she, through medication and therapy, is over this and has led a productive life in the last, how long was that, five, six years ago? Yes, um, six, seven years, yeah. So six, seven before, years ago. Yeah. So Just I've been there. I've done that. In other words, mm -hmm. you know, you don't yell, damn it, you're not fat to someone suffering from anorexia. But, you know, you're beautiful as God created you to be. You're lovely. And allow the therapist to help them out of that pit. Yeah. I think there's an Acne Church. I, Jeff Walton was writing about this that has a ministry to uh, those suffering from body disorders, anorexia, bulimia, in suburban Virginia. Uh, Jeff, uh, give a plug to that, if you will, in the comments, because that's a yeah, wonderful work for the church. Absolutely. Well, in here, you know, we are living in an age of the internet and social media where children are being raised on their looks entirely. How do you mm -hmm. look on a photo that you post on Instagram? How do you look on a photo that you put, post on Facebook? And you post this, I can't imagine uh, standing in front of a, your, your entire high school class back in the 80s and, and looking at your pictures on stage as, as the audience, your peers are looking at the same pictures. Yeah, that, that would be horrifying. Well, that, that's what kids are doing now. That horrifying thing of putting a picture of themselves 
and being judged by their peers and, and reading through the comments and being disheartened that I guess I don't look good and I, I am, you know, uh, what they say I am. And that leads to this dysphoria. Uh, the internet is evil and heartless to children. Instagram is anyway. Uh, and so is Twitter and the others because it leaves that false sense of identity. You are not your, li your, you are not your latest Instagram photo. I assure you that. I uh, watched a uh, online uh, forum class hosted by the exorcist for the Diocese of Manila, Roman Catholic priest who is an exorcist for Manila, and he was talking about how Satan uses social media mm -hmm. and that to basically destroy and corrupt so many people. And I know that sounds old fogeyish. Oh, they said that about rock music and uh, things like that. But I truly have seen the effects. I've seen young boys who have started looking at a pornography when they're 12. And by the time they're 15 and 16, they have a warped understanding of what girls want and what girls are like. Their understanding of sexuality um, is totally warped. And their brain wiring has been rewired by the use of pornography. Mm -hmm. And it's so very hard to pull them back. It takes time. It can be done. The internet can be, it can be a force for good, but it is so destructive when, when, well, when we who can do, well, we who can do something stand idly by and do nothing. Yeah. I'm going to provide this a, a, as a link below also, <laughs> Reddit and the British uh, Medical Journal. Um, one of the biggest problems now is you can't get the truth out. Um, in the press. It's very difficult to get a, a, a message that is uh, not in line with the zeitgeist. And right now, uh, there's really good medical journals, the uh, British Medical Journal, JAMA, uh, the American Medical Association, who are doing studies based on the vaccines that were released two years ago. And they're finding things that they, whoa, we didn't know this. And they're starting to publish stories that, okay, there, there are a significant degree of uh, cardiomyopathy, the enlargement of the heart, for younger kids who got the COVID uh, uh, Pfizer shot. We're, we're making note of that. And they're starting to publish the stories, and people like me are reading medical journals like that and trying to publish that story on Facebook so you all can read it, and Facebook is blocking it. And the, the British Medical Journal wrote a letter to Mark Zuckerberg this week, and it is just very, uh, yeah, the British can insult you beyond reason without you even knowing it. I, I'm going to post a link to this. But the British Medical Journal is like, listen, we are the fact checkers of the fact checkers. And we're going back and we're trying to, to bring uh, attention to some of these studies that we're doing now, uh, years after the vaccine. And we're, we're fighting that, yeah, there's, we may have gone to market too big, whatever, whatever. But here's the studies, here's the evidence, here's the science. And Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and the BBC and everybody else is blocking this from going, being made known. Well, I'm sorry, you, I think you, you can't do that. <laughs> Denmark, uh, I, th I believe it was Denmark, one of the Scandinavian countries has banned these vaccines for people under a certain age. I tried to yeah. share that. It was not successful. Yeah. The Florida Surgeon General uh, has recommended that uh, Florida physicians not give these vaccines to men under the age of 40. And, you know, that, that news is not getting out there because I think somebody at the Facebook's inner office thinks they're Jack Nicholson from and they saying that you can't handle the truth. <laughs> yes, uh, right. Therefore, we're not going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, no, and hopefully this this age of zeitgeist news is is going to end soon. Um, you know, the, you, every once in a while you have a hope because a story gets through. A Hunter Biden story finally makes it on the front page. Yeah, that was one week. <laughs> you know, just like, and so you just have to be patient and see what happens. But uh, you can come here as long as YouTube isn't blocking our sound again. Uh, you you can certainly hear the news, and we'll, we'll try and bring it to you uh, as it happens um, and avoid the zeitgeist. Yeah. I, and, and, I got and it. Listen, oh, hold on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. 
I don't wake up one day every morning and say, here's the latest conspiracy, I need to tell you about it. I, I, I'll wait and wait and wait to find out what the real conspiracies here are. The real conspiracy here is not letting the science be revealed after a two-year study on COVID vaccines. Kevin, here's the rabbit hole for this week's episode that I'm going to run down. Uh -oh. I, at coffee hour last, at coffee hour on Sunday, I was chatting to a parishioner, and we started talking about uh, Twitter. And she said, "Well, you know, I dated Jack Dorsey in high school, and my parents <laughs> are best friends <laughs> with Jack's parents, and I just don't know what happened to him. He looks like a bum on the street with his beard, and I think something's happened to his brain because that's not the Jack I remembered from uh, high school." It's a small world, Kevin. It's a it's small so world when Jack Dorsey's old girlfriend is in my Bible founder, study. Founder of Twitter, for people who don't you know, know that. Wow, that is that is a small world. Yeah, he probably didn't have that big beard going on back in high school. Oh, no, no. Uh, no. It took, uh, well, my, my, my. But she a, thinks he's going around the bend. But, uh, well, he could be turning orthodox, and so we don't even know it. All right, uh, back in the news. And... This is just going to be what we call status normal. Uh, the Colorado baker who went up the chain of legal defense because he wouldn't bake the gay cake is back in the news again because we'll, we'll make him bake a different cake. A transphobic, no transphobic, a transgendered lawyer uh, called his bakery and asked that he would bake a coming out cake of pink and blue uh in his artistic fashion he they want to be sure he makes it and you know applies his art to it and he said no i'm not gonna use my art skill to bake your cake and they sued him and that suit went up the chain uh the colorado uh attorney general's office whatever fined the baker 500 dollars, and now we're back in it again the the guy who won because the Colorado judicial system did it wrong, the Supreme Court said he did it wrong, they did it wrong, uh, and, and accused them of being really, uh, what would it say it, godly phobic. Uh, we're now back to this poor guy, and this is just the way it's gonna be, George. They're gonna sue him every couple months. Jack Phillips is the Colorado baker, and in, uh, was it 2018, the US Supreme Court said he cannot be compelled for speech purposes to make a cake with a political or social message with which he disagrees when he uses his artistic talents or uses his business. You cannot be compelled to do that. And so he was asked to bake a cake for a wedding of uh, two people of the same sex. He declined and recommended another bakery. No, they wanted him to do it and they wanted him to use his artistry because he was a notable baker, if you will. Your Supreme Court said you cannot do that. You cannot compel free speech. Well, as soon as that case was handed down, a person named Autumn Scandarini, Scandari, Scand, uh, Autumn, had been a man, was now a woman, was an attorney, and is a transgender activist, called up Jack Phillips, said, I want a cake, blue on the outside, pink on the inside, with, with icing that, you know, showing my he's being cut off or you know basically pro you know promoting my transition medically fr uh, from a man to woman and uh, Philip said no I'm sorry I'm not gonna do that she or she sued and the Colorado as you say uh, state anti-discrimination office supported by the ACLU found him guilty fined him $500 it's now back before the federal courts. And this Autumn fellow has said, even if I lose this, I'm gonna keep suing him. I'm an attorney with nothing else to do but to sue this guy until he's out of business or dead because he will not support my views. See, this is this case that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would be thrown out of court, it's laughable. But now black is white, white is black, things are tops are turvy, and free speech now means you are compelled to say my speech rather than free speech meaning I can only, I am free to say what I want. It's now I am free, I must say what you want. Mm -hmm. 
yeah i mean weird it's no longer we're yeah it, it is it's because it's no longer about free speech it's about uh are, are you going to be allowed to participate in commerce um mm -hmm. here we go are you or ever have you been a member of the communist party are you or ever have you been a christian i mean we're repeating mccarthyism you know, mm -hmm. you can only be a actor in Hollywood if you've never been a communist. You can only be a work. You can only sell cakes if you've never been a Christian. How we're but, we're months away from this, George. Kevin, and it's actually worse than McCarthyism. As William F. Buckley used to say, there actually were communists in the State Department. <laughs> well, jo Joe McCarthy <laughs> just was exaggerating. <laughs> Joe McCarthy was just exaggerating the number of communists, but there were communists. Alger Hiss. Uh, sure. There well, were absolutely. communists yeah. in the media, uh, in the the I'm sorry, in the Hollywood. Uh, but just uh, McCarthy basically screwed everything up by being a bit of a jackass. But he here, was we're in a different yeah. world. We're we're in a different world where uh, we are now facing the uh, we cannot criticize um, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, who ran for president on the Democratic ticket two years ago, announced today she's leaving the Democratic Party as over speech, compelled speech. And one of the things she talked about was uh, anti-white racism. She said today, you know, one of the things that Democrats don't talk about is the racism against white people. That's something Tulsi Gabbard cannot say. And I think I'm, I'm expecting her to be banned from Facebook uh, from this point forward, because, of course, racism only works one way, according to our masters. Um, but it's just the good news is that people uh, I have no political support for Tulsi Gabbard, but she's willing to stand and speak what she sees to be the truth and let's see how the mob you know tr falls down on top of her and tries to silence her yeah well yeah, she's an outlier within the democratic party but but you know did she say what party she's going not to? no i think she's just going to be an independent okay right. we, we could have used her but you know but we are in these absolute crazy times uh, America has not suffered under this type of uh, political pressure ever, where um, there's a cancel culture. Uh, the cancel culture has never been this obvious, this relevant, has absolutely taken over academia. There was a report that the top 25 colleges in our country had no conservative speakers invited this l last academic year. Nobody, no Kevin Carlson's were allowed to come in and, and give a, a political speech from the bright side, the, you know, or the middle even. Uh, every speaker is pro-trans, pro-LGTB, pro, you know, pro-leftist. And you can't have an American marketplace and an America be successful without a fully embodied two to three, four party system. It, you, you can't have one party politics in academia. It's ridiculous and it won't work. Now federal judges are refusing to hire Yale graduates. What is that about? You know, Yale was the, the quintessential degree. You went there for a couple of years. To have a Yale law degree was your ticket to a federal job somewhere, within or without the courts. And here's a, here, you know, as some of you know, I went there, uh, not to the law school, but you know, this recent thing of uh, canceling people like Alexander Hamilton uh, is the most recent cancel victim, or Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. Eliu Yale, Eli Yale, was was involved in the slave trade. And I will bet you every penny I own that Yale does not change its name out of shock and horror at having its money come from the slave trade because people pay a fortune to get that four letter word on their diploma. It's yeah. a brand name. And so, you know, hypocrisy we will cancel some people, but we're not going to cancel other people if it impinges upon ourselves. Hell no. Yeah, it's crazy. All righty, I got one last story here on the docket. Uh, the one gloved man, Archbishop of Dublin, Michael Jackson, has made my news outline. Let's talk about him a little bit, George. 
Michael, not that Michael Jackson, the gloved one, oh. but the other Michael Jackson. Sorry. The Archbishop of uh, Dur uh, Dublin in the Church Dublin, of Ireland. Yeah. The Irish Times released a major scoop story this past week. Michael Jackson is it a bit of is a prickly person. He is uh, well. He is a character, uh, as someone described him as the Charles Benison of the Church of Ireland. And if you know anything, that means something. Well, the uh, the Irish the Dublin Synod uh, held a meeting, and this was not only released. In, it was a while ago, a few months ago, but they finally made the news public. The Dublin Synod passed 15 measures that stripped the Archbishop of almost all authority over the finances and administration of the diocese, leaving only liturgical and ordination issues in his hands. Michael Jackson, and the issue was relatively minor. I think there was an inner city parish that he took over the finances, and it was in, a, in an area where they had inherited money. But it was also, it had become a place where drug addicts would shoot up in the graveyard and and the, the parish volunteers were spending all their time cleaning up feces and needles and things, you know, shooing bums out of the pews. And the, and the church diocese was going to step in and help, and instead they just kept the money and let this church fall apart. You know, it's the sort of thing that can happen in New York or Philadelphia or whatever. But... Michael Jackson did the impossible of uniting the liberals and the conservatives, clergy and laity, and they voted him essentially out of power. Now, this is good news for those in the Church of England who say that they're powerless, because the Church of Ireland's not that different in many respects from the Church of England in its canon law and its structures and its authority. So here's a bishop basically being cut down, way down to size, and the leadership had failed. Friends, in the Church of Our, in the Church of England, you can do that too. There's still a chance. General Stinnett still has a chance. Now, in the Episcopal Church, we can do that well on the diocesan level, but there's no chance to do it on the national level. But in England, you still have a chance to basically get rid of these bad bishops or take away their authority and basically sort of suggest to them, get out of town. You're 64 and a half. I, I'd take a six months sabbatical and then we'll say goodbye. Well, and if that doesn't work, now there's a a viable alternative. You know, something that, mm -hmm. you know, the ANIE, you know, and I'm being honest here, was not a really viable entity uh, until recently. And it's good to see that that's coming around and it's coming around because of the power vacuum that exists within the Church of England. Those shores are not being represented by people who are fighting for the kingdom. They're being represented by people who are trying to keep the power, to keep their you know zeitgeist going. I I don't want to overuse that word, but boy, that word really applies to the Church of England, George. Well, let's say it's the Weltschauung of the Church of England. The worldview of the Church of England is not health. Is not a healthy. It's not a productive. It's not a godly one among its top leaders right now. In my opinion, I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode six hundred and seventy seven hundred seven hundred and sixty five of Anglican Unscripted.